because you know why? Why? Because it feels right. It feels right. Legendary. Press that damn button. Let's go. Come on. I'm hitting, I'm hitting the button. Okay, good. The, the button's been hit. Hello, Robert. How are you? Hello, Adam. Over here. Over here. Correct. Over here, Adam. Thanks, mate. Yep. Sorry if I'm a little grainy. I'm on a, a mobile setup here. And just to let everyone know, I'm sitting in the same chair as the president of the Greater Houston Pickleball Association, <laughs> a.k.a. my father, Terry Stone. So, Oh, I'm, Terry Stone. Terry Stone. I'm ready to rock. Ready to rock this morning. You know, it it suits you. You just yeah. have a glow. You have a glow about you being in Houston. I, Look at you go. I feel great. I love being on the third coast, Robert. It's a great place to be. I need you to tell the story. No, <laughs> never, never. I, I not need to you. <laughs> it's so good, Adam. Never. I can't. Maybe, maybe episode like fifty or something. I might do okay. it. But right now, it's too early. I can't. The, pod, I can't the pod's it. too fresh, and it's 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 too much in its infancy to <laughs> unleash the story. Yeah, it's a, everybody's gonna be really disappointed in the story when they actually hear it. I yeah, that's probably it, true. I anything, just find it very, very, very funny. Yeah, anything you hype up like that usually disappoints. Yeah. but you know, whatever. It wouldn't disappoint me. I would just watch and laugh. <laughs> All right, we have a we have a pod with some results, but yeah, not not too much upcoming. A couple tournaments in a couple weeks, but nothing nothing pressing this weekend, which is unusual for pro pickleball because there have been so many damn tournaments this year that usually there's something every weekend. So we have a rare weekend with, uh, with nothing happening, but we had a weekend where we had a few things happening um, behind us here. We had, we had next gen, right. Which I didn't watch any of, but um, I know it happened, which is important. You're running a pickleball podcast, knowing it happened. It's very important. There was a, um, I don't know if it was an APP. I think it was an APP somehow affiliated, but it was the World Pickleball Open in Florida. It looked pretty amateurish just on the stream. The stream was kind of shaky and sideways. Mm. There was like chain link fence exposed everywhere. It, it, it looked like pickleball circa 2017. Gotcha. Like if you're watching the streams. Right. And it's like a 25K, so I was surprised there were so many um, so many good players playing, but it was in Florida. Easy trip for most most people, you know. No overnight stay, drive, play a little pickleball, get a little money. So I get it. Um, but with all the people talking about how long of a year it was, it was interesting to see people just continuing to play. Um, and then we had the we had the TK Showcase in Newport Beach, the PPA tournament, which uh, I think that'll probably be the focal point of what we talk about today in terms of results. But um, yes, Adam. Robert. Don't forget, we had the Duper College Championships as well uh, on the M- yes on MLP. So uh, that was that was pretty cool. I actually went down to do a camp uh, with old Simone down in Florida, and at the airport before I left, I saw the uh, the UNC team, which ended up getting first. So that was pretty cool uh, for my area. And uh, four four events this past weekend. Let's go pickleball. That's pretty cool. And it's going to be, I mean, I think we'll look back at the, this collegiate championship with Duper and be like, talk about five years, 10 years and be like, whoa, how different is it? You know, based on, based on where like we, we see pickleball going and just the landscape of the infrastructure being built with the colleges, hopefully soon to be high schools. And um, yeah, I think, I think we'll look back in five to 10 years and be like, holy cow, pickleball has come so far. God, it's just such a great, like club sport, intramural sport for college. It's it's so good. It's so it's co-ed. It's, you know, uh, one of those, one of those sports where it's, you know, it hasn't quite got that huge gap between male and female. They can play on the same court together very comfortably. So I I think it's, I think it's awesome for so, so many ways. And to get those young bucks uh, going, especially at the college level, I think it's great. And it's kind of the beauty of the MLP format is that it works so well um, not just with major league pickleball, but it works well with the, you know, the, the, any, any team event in pickleball. I know they had the minor league pickleball with the, you know, 22, 2018, mm-hmm. where you're doing a combined duper of your team and you're right. Like the, the, the genderless ageless, it doesn't matter, you know, how old you are. There's no, there's no uh, age brackets. There's no gender brackets. It's just, you're doing it based on your duper. And that's, that's cool. You could have a team of all. You could have a team of all women playing a team of all men, and uh, in the same in the same skill level. 
Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And that, that was, that was my experience in the first MLP, Robert, where we had, I think we had five dream breakers and I played, I played only one male because Callie Smith gets jacked up playing guys. So they just matched me up with the women playing singles uh, in the dream breakers. So it was, uh, doesn't matter what level it is to get those yeah. the interesting matchups. I mean, that's just fun stuff. 100%. What do you want to get into, Adam? Oh, let's, let's get right into it, Robert. So uh, yeah, let's start off with Takea. Uh, definitely the, uh, uh, you know, a, a good, good depth, good talent uh, at the Takea PPA showcase at Newport Beach. I think, what, what do they call it now? The ten, is, is it the tennis and pickleball club at Newport Beach or is it still just the tennis club? It should just be the pickleball club. I'm not sure. I don't. I don't know what the actual name is, but I think. I think they do have it. I don't remember. Somebody said the number of members they have on the pickleball side, and it's um, an absurd number for like how big that place is. It's not that big, right? No, but it's but they have uh, man, an absurd they, number of members. Yeah, they've embraced it because I've kind of seen the progression the last couple of years. They got a few more courts. They got a nice little, uh, you know, restaurant bar area in the middle there that they've been working on. So they're 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 doing it right down there, and it's it's a pretty good atmosphere to play pickle. So. Uh, uh, yeah, so um, let's start off with the ladies. Um, I thought there were some some pretty interesting seeds just to start off with. So we had uh, David and Coop at the, as, as the seven seed, uh, Bright and Todd as the four seed, and then we had uh, Catherine and Brooke Buckner uh, as the three seed. So uh, those those PPA, yeah, those PPA points definitely are are still a factor uh, for some of these seedings, which is a pretty big deal who, who you get matched up with in the quarters and the semis. So, uh, huge deal. Yeah. So I thought, I mean, obviously it makes sense w- when you consider, uh, the PPA points with, you know, David and Coop, not, not playing a ton of those and bright and Todd also, uh, kind of having a less volume than obviously Catherine, who has done very, very well and played all of them. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm not not sure that's the right way to do it, but it makes sense given given how how the PPA does do, does the seeding. So, what do you think the right way to do it is? I don't know. There has to be some, you know. I mean these the, these matchups are huge. Uh, like I said, in, in the quarters and the semis, and and where where you stack up, and if you have, you know, uh, I mean it could be something as as drastic as a team that should be the two or three seed is actually the eight or nine seed, and when you get yeah. those big big discrepancies, it. it 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 gets you a big match earlier in the tournament and the later that you have those big, big, correct matchups, uh, the later on, the better, uh, just for the overall, yeah. uh, overall part of the tournament. So it's, uh, not, it's not, adva- it's not advantageous to the PPA players either, right? They could get screwed oh, totally. with like a terrible matchup first round when they shouldn't be. Absolutely. And I think we've seen it maybe even more, some of the singles where you, you have this round of 16 matchup that could easily be a semifinal matchup. And I, I'm not sure it does anyone justice, uh, in those situations. So, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know exactly what it's some combination of uh, duper and world pickleball ratings. I, I don't know, but when you get, yeah. w- when there's, when the rankings are, or, or the, the seeds are so contingent upon volume uh, as opposed to, uh, and I'm not saying volume has no place, but it has to be balanced out in some way, shape or form. If it's just yeah. all volume, it's, it's going to create issues in the seeding process. So, um, yeah, I just think about like the guys that don't play a ton, right? Like that, that to me, that's where like using a rating makes a lot of sense, like a duper or something. Like you're gonna get like you know, Lang for example, who doesn't who doesn't play a ton, but like who nobody wants to see first round or second round or third round. Right. You know what I mean? And um, if but if you went off if you went off a rating, he would be seated, I think, probably pretty appropriately based on who his partner is and all that within the draw. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, no, definitely. But then, but that's kind of removed. You know, we talked about you talked about the, um, the the quantity thing too, which is also important. That removes the quantity thing a little bit, but it's still a mm-hmm. factor in terms of right. The rating. Right. Yeah. Ba- balancing out quality of wins and and volume is probably just a constant work in progress uh, to 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 make it perfect. But to to go straight up on PPA points seems seems uh, like it, there there's got to be a better way. You know. Yeah. Hundred uh, percent. Okay, so we have uh, Lucy and Callie still holding on to the number one seed. Uh, not that they've played poorly lately, but definitely had stronger results uh, earlier in the year. And uh, they were beaten by Irina Tereshenko and Edda Wright, 11-8, yeah. 11-5 in the quarterfinals. So, uh, you know, not a total blowout, but pretty comfortable win for Irina and Edda. And 
uh, Irina and Edda followed that up with 11-5, 11-0 victory in the semifinals against uh, Anna Bright and Paris Todd to move on to Championship Sunday. So those scores are very much, uh, maybe not surprising, but that's quite a statement from those two players to to knock off two quality teams. Uh, let's see here. As Tropical would say, that's not Irina Tereshenko. That's Irina Terror. Shinko. <laughs> You're right. But I mean, 44 to 18 in those two matchups uh, over more, more than doubling their opponent's points. That's pretty, pretty quality stuff. Uh, and, you know, Irina, she underdogs going into both those matchups as well, by, by the way, oh, on paper. Definitely. And Irina, yeah. you know, maybe she'll she'll go a tournament or two with, you know, not 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 getting in the mix on the standard, maybe not even particularly close. And then all of a sudden she just pops back in there, whether it's singles or or most likely her two, her two best events are uh, gender doubles and singles. So yeah. she's a veteran. She's a veteran. She's been around the block and every now and then she just squeezes her herself right in the mix. And that's exactly what she, what she did here. I mean, just looking at the year as a whole, Irina's had a great year. Um, you know, I think looking at the last couple of years, some people probably would have said she's like trending down or whatever it may be, but she, um, she's had a great year, you know, got a couple, especially financially in terms of earnings, yeah. you know, one, one, two MLPs ripped off 50 K there and still, still as relevant as ever, um, in these, in these draws with, with all these new women coming in. So props to Irina for, for, uh, you know, putting her foot in the ground, stake in the ground and, um, saying, you know, I'm still here. Yep, solid, just solid veteran play from her and Edda Wright. Uh, man, she uh, she's playing big this tournament, obviously. Yep. And you know, I've heard a couple uh, often when when I when, when I hear someone who I value their opinion talk about another player, I very much listen. And I've had a couple birdies talking about how Edda could be, you know, the next big thing or the next uh, the next player that kind of jumps into that seven or eight or nine uh, woman pool right after Anna Lee Waters as very much in the mix for, uh, you know, uh, being at the top end of that player pool and, and having some really good results and, and being an excellent player. I think she's only been playing for about a year and she has some, she has some very nice physical tools and some really good power on both wings, forehand and backhand at the kitchen line. So uh, yeah, big time stuff from her and uh, probably a true break, uh, you know, a breakout party um, moving on to that championship Sunday. So I'm really excited to see what she has in store moving forward because she, she's a player, Rob. No, hundred percent. And you're right. I, I don't know how tall she is or like what her actual listing is, but it feels like she's, she's a good presence on court, you know, good reach. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she hasn't played much. She hasn't played any singles or has she played a little singles? I don't, I don't believe that she has played much, if any singles at all. So smart, I know she's smart woman. <laughs> sorry, yeah, smart <laughs> woman. I know uh, she was on the same MLP team as Thomas Wilson. So I know she squeezed in a couple tournaments with Thomas, who is probably her uh, best partner to date before Irina. So uh, as she obviously has some 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 solid skills as she gets better and better partners I, I expect her to make a few more runs uh here in the next few months and uh yeah good stuff from Meta. yeah it's a big tournament 11 5 11 0 to me is probably more surprising than the than the prior result you should the 11 11 5 over lucy cali yeah no i i agree uh definitely and i, I think at this point bright and todd there's probably not much difference between them and Lucy and Callie from a, uh, from a, uh, uh, you know, where, where they stand perspective. So obviously eight and five solid result, but five and zero oh against, against Brighton Todd is, is very, very nice uh, for Irina and Etta. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We all, we also had David and Coop at a relatively tight match with uh, Jesse and Lindsay early on in three games. Uh, I believe it was yeah. fairly comfortable in game three. Uh, then they went on to beat Elise and Dijon Mustard comfortably after uh, Elise and Megan listened to these scores against uh, Catherine Parento and Brooke Buckner. 10-12, 13-11, 12-10. So that was, a, that was a wild match. Uh, I believe Lauren Stratman was streaming that one. Uh, I caught mm -hmm. a little bit, little bit of it, but wow, uh, those scores are just insane. And yeah. then they, they went on to uh, defeat Irina and Etta that championship Sunday in a tight four games. So uh, we have uh, Etta and Irina with the silver medal and Coop and David with the gold medal. 
And then we had Bright and Todd coming back through the backdrop to capture that bronze uh, uh, for the women's doubles. Yeah, big, big, big day for Coop and, uh, and Viv. Absolutely. And uh, makes a lot of sense. Vivian uh, Coop, 5'10", has some good reach, can play that left side. And, and when, when Vivian, you know, Vivian in her third or 40% of that right side uh, side of the court is just an absolute stud, one of the best mm-hmm. in the game. So to have a, a partner who can cover her back a little bit in the middle uh, I think that pairing uh, makes a lot of sense to have to have some good results. I mean, honestly, Adam, I, I usually don't like to do this because I know you never like to toot your own horn. That's not <laughs> just that's not who you are. Never. But but I'm gonna have to do it for you. I mean, your your number two coop pick, you know, number two in the world, is looking really strong right now. Yes, yeah, really so, uh, strong. Yes, uh, I, I appreciate that, and I think that. Those were probably of my top 10. The two most controversial was to put Coop at number two and Anna Bright at number three. And I, I think that they've done everything that they need to do to make those, those picks legitimate. Uh, thanks for making me look good, ladies. I appreciate it. Uh, just a couple more notes on the, on the women's draw, Rob. Oh, were you going to say something, Rob? Please. No. Okay. Uh, just a, a quick uh, uh, for, for the back draw and the ladies, we had Schneeman and Retger having a nice win against Catherine and Brooke Buckner. And Gaetan Leach and Yana Gretschkina Newell having a very nice run to get fourth, defeating Callie and Lucy, and then losing in three games in the bronze medal match uh, to Todd and Bright. So a couple, a couple nice wins and nice runs in the back draw. Didn't want to forget about those ladies. Yeah, that's a great result. And I think it was really close in the bronze, right? Yes, I, I want to say 11-9 in the third. That's actually. what I was thinking. Yeah, so, so that, that, uh, I mean, that's a toss-up. That could go either way. So, um, yeah, huge result for huge result for Yana and, and Sierra. Definitely. Uh, moving on to mixed doubles at the Takea, we had Mary Brasha and Julian Arnold uh, beating Collins' brother in CP 11-4, 11-4. A fantastic result and a yeah. very lopsided affair. Uh, no one saw that com- coming. But, uh, hey, Julian, when he gets hot, it's, it's next yeah. level good uh, with his court coverage and his power. So uh, while it's definitely um, a little surprising, you, you, it kind of makes sense that, that Julian could get really hot and do some damage. And, and that, that four and four result is great for Brasha and Julian. Uh, next round, they ended up losing to KK, Coop and Kohler. Uh, and then Coop and Kohler defeating the Newmans in three in the semis to move on to championship Sunday. Very, very nice result for Coop and Kohler. You know, you know, AJ had the crab walk going along the kitchen line and uh, doing some damage like he likes to do. So uh, mm-hmm. I did not get to see uh, those early round matches, but a uh, great result for uh, Coop and Kohler. Uh, that was in the top half of the draw and the bottom half. We had an upset, uh, an upset. We had Gretch Keena and Patrick and defeating Leah Jansen and Thomas Wilson early on. I believe that was the round of 16. Uh, Lucy and Matt defeating uh, Jay and Jesse in three. And then we have a Coop and Kohler win and championship Sunday in a close four games against Matt and Lucy to give Kohler, I believe, his first PPA championship and Coop uh, her second PPA title of the day. Very, very nice play from Coop and Kohler. And they seemed very, very happy with the result. And they absolutely should have been. Yeah, that's a, I mean, epic tournament for Kohler. Um, Coop's, and again, Coop just solidifying herself as that number two that you that you talk about. So Adam Stone, I think you had a better day than any of these people. Actually, <laughs> thank, thank you, Robert. And uh, also, I, I would say, I would definitely lean towards gender doubles being Coop's best uh, event of the doubles. So to see her so. have, yeah, to see her have this result in mixed, uh, kudos to her. Very nice job. And then also in the back draw, we had uh, Todd, a uh, Paris Todd, and Tyson McGuffin getting dropped down to the back. And then we had uh, Dylan Frazier and Anna Bright. Both had a pretty smooth route to the bronze medal match. And then Bright and Frazier ended up, ended up taking that in three games to uh, to get that bronze medal. So. Uh, no, no, no real tight ones for either team uh, in those two or three match matches leading up to the bronze. And then, uh, as I said, Brighton Frazier taking it. Yeah. I mean, Brighton Frazier, solid. Uh, good to see. I mean, we always talk about it. Tyson doesn't get a lot of credit in doubles, but he's always right there in the mix. Yeah. You know, close to the podium. It's wild. Yeah, I, I agree. It's the consistency uh, is really, really good, regardless of who his partner is. So he just. 
he makes a ton of balls. That's a big deal. Yeah. It's it's a game of errors, Robert. It's a Everyone. game of errors. It's a game of errors. Remember that. So uh, moving on to men's at Takea, pretty pretty chalky to be honest with you. There were some there were some close matches sprinkled in, but no no crazy upsets. Nothing too out of yep. the ordinary. And of course, when I say chalky, I just mean kind of standard standard stuff. Um, so we had uh, uh, the back draw as well, pretty chalky with with Loong and Dawson taking out the cousins. 12, 10, 10, 12, 11, 9 in the bronze medal match. And then uh, obviously we had uh, Matt and Riley with the slight upset in the championship Sunday to take down uh, Colin and his brother uh, in, a, in a fairly, fairly close four games. Actually, yeah. they, they ended up winning the first game and games two, three, and four were not blowouts, but they weren't no. particularly close either. No, they weren't. They weren't eleven nines. I think it was what four, seven, and four, or six, seven, and four, or some something along those lines. But yes. none really tight at the end. Um, and yeah, it was it was an impressive showing by by Riley and Matt again. Um, yeah, and it yeah. shows you that that Colin and his brother don't have you know, it's 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 a back and forth affair. Like they know what they're trying to do, but you know, there's matches where uh, where Matt and Riley are just out executing, and that's what's happening. And you know, and still a slight, still a slight upset, right? Like they're yes. not, I wouldn't say they're necessarily favored, um, Matt and Riley, but you know, it's definitely not unexpected for them to win. But, um, yeah. I think that that's, that's trending in their direction towards Matt and Riley in terms of, you know, being more and more comfortable with how they want to play them. Riley, man, Riley is ridiculous, Rob. I mean, he 100%. is, I mean, so I, I watched this. I actually watched this one back, and I, I don't really think. It, often you kind of have there's a hole or someone not playing their best pickleball or someone getting exploited. I, I kind of saw everyone playing solid but unspectacular. But the difference is Riley's just a monster. I mean, he his his hands is. I mean, there's no holes in the game whatsoever, and he just has a little a little more reach and a, a little more uh, kitchen coverage than Colin's brother. And I think that was the difference because that yeah. pancake, that pancake is just absolutely ridiculous and he does not miss backhands whatsoever. So no, you're right. That is the difference in terms of, in terms of looking at the two of them. Um, Riley's just, he, he, he's much less attackable than Colin's brother. Right. Yes. And, and, and really uh, Matt Wright did a great job of, of, of having some nice combinations and catching, ca uh, catching, catching them off guard with some nice. And, and once, once those firefights start, I just, I, I like Riley and Matt in, in the, like in a vacuum neutral firefights, of course, if there's a great yeah. initial attack, it's going to give one team the advantage, but yeah. neutral firefights, I, I like Matt and Wright in those situations, Rob. Yeah, no, same. I think you have to, especially with how, with how Riley's able to, really pitch middle hard and like you they basically are man riley are really good at setting up that firefight so they're both where they want to be where riley's sitting pancake and matt's sitting backhand and like if the ball is in that if the ball's in that zone you're in trouble because their hands are so fast matt with the backhand riley with the pancake that it's mm -hmm. not getting through there it's not it's just not getting through also pretty pretty funny situation as well uh, I, like, like I said, I was watching uh, this match back and at nine, five in game two, uh, Matt had a one, two combination and hit uh, Colin in the twig and berries. And we oh, know man. that is a great strategy for beating Colin is to hit him in either <laughs> the head or the twig and berries. And I think that had a pretty big factor moving on in the match. <laughs> How did I miss that? Was oh, there was not a, he, he did like oh, like this, and it, it it caught him right right in that area. So I thought that was pretty funny for sure. <laughs> well, no coincidence. The next two games went quick. Yes, and 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 I'll tell you what, I I kind of wonder if some of the the Matt Wright Riley Newman just edge edge get, gets to Colin and his brother a little bit because I'll yeah. tell you what, Matt was. He, he had a couple Matt type things, but Riley was saying, yep. And, and almost after every shot that he put away or whatever he's saying, yep, he's doing this. He's barely paddle tapping in between the games. He's just kind of doing his thing. As we talked about many times before, Matt and Riley might be made for each other. 
but they have an edge and they have a little swag to them. And I, I didn't see it physically bothering Colin and his brother, but you never know. They're pretty, they're pretty low key, kind of robotic, kind of going through the motions and, and Riley and Matt very much are not doing that. I wonder if it affects their play at all. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good point. And as Riley likes, likes to say, it's, it's fun beating the robots. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it, it is. So when you said robotic, I was like, that's funny because Riley says the same. Yeah, so uh, just just something to think about. Uh, yeah, when, when someone's just always on you, always making little comments, never shows any weakness whatsoever, just has that confidence and that swagger, it, it can leak over to your opponents and give you that little teeny edge that you need. And, and obviously little teeny edges in this specific matchup are a big deal, Rob. Yeah, 100%. And yeah, we'll see. We'll see. There's what? There's one more PPA tournament this year. That's in Orlando. And then there's uh, there's more of like a little special. I don't know if it's an exhibition or team event uh, at in Vegas at the Mandalay Bay, which should be a cool venue. Oh, that's the uh, bubbly, the bubbly one. That's yes. the right. bubbly. So yeah, so winding down the year, um, we've seen a lot of that matchup, Matt, Matt and Riley versus Colin. So hopefully, you know, it's fun. It's, it's a fun one too, because you don't know what the outcome is going to be. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's trending to get closer and closer in terms of who's that underdog. I think we're probably at like a 52, 48 to uh, yeah, Colin. De- definitely. And I think I saw you, you with a tweet that said it was maybe eight to three or something like that. Uh, yeah, total? I think it's four, four now. Four, like I think okay. eight and four. But they they started off down four zero on the year. Exactly. Today. So it's basically been an even matchup for the last eight eight times. Yeah. I I think it's great. Uh, we talk about stale matchups that we see all the time, but when it's a real back and forth rivalry, that's it's fun. That's, that's that has its own intrigue. So yeah, uh, great great to see. Congratulations to Matt and Riley. You really took it to them and uh, deserved that gold medal. So on the other end of the country, Robert, we had the World Pickleball Open. And as you said, uh, pretty, some pretty solid players, uh, maybe not the depth of a, of a typical APP with, with some players playing the, the, the Takea, but there were some high-end talent in this, uh, in this tournament. And I saw a couple interesting results. We had uh, in the semifinals, we had Stax Root and Tejas defeating Rettenmeyer and Tardio 11-1, 11-3. Now, I, I mean, that is pretty surprising to me. I yeah. would have given a slight edge to Rettenmeyer and Tardio in that match. So to win that convincingly from Stax Root and Tejas, they are not they are not the singles boys anymore. These guys are playing some really good doubles, yeah. and uh, I'll apologize to them for for calling them the singles boys because this this is a great result. And then also, Rob, in the gold medal match against Andre Deescu and J W Johnson, they forced they won the two out of three and forced uh, a game to fifteen. They ended up uh, losing that game, but to take two out of three from Andre and J W uh, is pretty impressive. That's, I mean, that's good pickleball period. Uh, you know, ha- it has to be. So that's a, yeah, I didn't, I didn't even follow those results, but that is surprising to me. And um, yeah, I mean, maybe you calling them singles guys motivated them out and maybe you did them a favor. Yeah, maybe so. And it'll, it'll be it interesting. Be a great general manager. I'll just, let me say it. You'd be a great general manager. That's what I want. Team coach, general manager, throw it out there. I'll throw it out there every episode till someone, uh, <laughs> till somebody does something. You haven't been hired yet. What has happened? I, I haven't heard anything back yet. I can't believe unbelievable. It. That's that's. I, that's I thought your I thought your phone would be ringing. Right, I can and just I, see like a landline at your house in Houston where it's just like posted <laughs> on the wall, long uh-huh. cord. I can see the whole thing. Yes, uh, it's yes, absolutely, and uh, yeah, it'll be interesting also to see. Uh, I did not watch any of these matches, but I uh, I know that Dayescu is playing a little bit with with Deckel Bar, and obviously Dayescu playing the right side, not his most comfortable side with J.W. Johnson. We'll kind of yeah. see how he adapts to that right side role. With uh, I'm not exactly sure. I think it might be just a handful that he has with Deckel, but yeah. I'm pretty sure he's going to be playing right with Deckel. So uh, it's an adjustment. We talk about it all the time. He's played. 90% of his pickleball on the left side. So uh, he obviously has the skill set to, to be fine over there on the right side, but we'll just have to see moving forward uh, if he really embraces that role like uh, a few other left side players have done recently. Yeah. 
yeah, it's and definitely then, an adjustment. But I think, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's tough for me to see him on the right because he plays his best when he's moving a lot and he's taking a lot of court. Like that's like mm-hmm. when Andre is kind of stationary is when I think he can get tangled up a little bit. But when mm-hmm. he's in control and moving, he's very, very effective and very good. So that'll be very interesting to watch. Right. And uh, so obviously that was the gold and silver medalist. And then we did have Rettenmeyer and Tardio coming back through to capture bronze. I believe yeah. uh, Staxrud and Tejas beat them 11-8, 11-8 in the bronze. So a much tighter match than that previous one. Yeah. Uh, mixed doubles. We had a pretty smooth ride for Gabe Tardio and Georgia Johnson. Uh, they ended up capturing gold comfortably. Uh, silver medal, medal to Ryler DeHart and Megan Fudge, your nemesis. And uh, bronze medal to Federico Stackroot and Krista Gechiva. Not sure if that's correct how to say it. Uh, the women's, uh, you know, obviously, when you have, we have a little, little thinner field, uh, some of the women's will, will, will take the brunt of that more than the men, as we've talked about in, in depth, maybe too much about there being more depth on the men's and less on the women's. Uh, Millie Rain and Georgia Johnson with gold. Amanda Hendry, Shelby Bates with silver, and Heather Nobler and Meredith Laughlin with bronze at the World Pickleball Open. Some new names. Yes, exactly. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's pretty much the recap. It's fun to talk about pickleball again. Our last couple episodes have, have, have not necessarily been talking about uh, on-court pickleball, so uh, nice to get some great action this past weekend. What do you mean we haven't been talking about pickleball? <laughs> you know exactly what I mean, Rob. What were we talking about, Adam? Well, we have some more. Uh, Those topics not to be mentioned ever yes, again. Yes, exactly. Ever again. Uh, well, we have so, some more interesting situations that kind of uh, arose this past weekend as well. Uh, possible serve gate in the Tyson and the Jay Davillier singles match. Yeah. It was, it was pretty interesting, and it seemed to get a pretty big buzz on social media uh, about the situation. So I, I guess – what happened was the rule is if you get called for an illegal serve, you get a redo. I think that, and this is a, apparently a PPA only rule, which seems weird. Like why would, you know, I know PPA has done their own thing for some things like the let the no spin serve, but this seems like a pretty like weird rule for the PPA to do their own thing with. Right. Like, so I, that, that, yeah, I don't know why they would just go into the serve and be like, well, let's just, you know, instead of this, let's just do a redo if they hit it too high. I'm like yes, what? Right. Like, why would you change it? Why would you change it? Yeah. Very, very interesting. And so basically what happened was I'm not sure if Jay was just, he was frustrated. Yeah. I'm not sure if Jay was just taking a crack at making some serves. He was trying to make a point that he thinks he was, serve is illegal. He was definitely making a point. Making like a point. Okay. the first couple were like, I'm talking like chin high where he's making contact from. Like <laughs> right. He was definitely and, making a point, not pushing, not trying to push the limits. He was just and, like, I'll tell you what, in, in an interesting dynamic too, because they're doubles partners. They, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and honestly, dude, it's, it's like, it never really gets called if it's, if it's in between, right? If it's like questionable, they just let you do it. So what we see is we see guys going higher and higher um, kind of with where they're making contact. And very often like Tyson's is pretty close, right? Like he could probably be called for a handful of them per match. They're just not going to do it because it's so, it's so borderline. Right. And even Colin's brother, he's making contact way high now. Whereas before it was, like it was well, it was well below waist, and now it's waist or a little above, oftentimes. So that's what we would get. I mean, we when we have subjective serve rules where the ref has to call it, we're gonna have these issues. People are gonna push it, of course. So until we have just a purely objective way to serve where there's no question, then this stuff's gonna be continued to to be pushed. Definitely, I, I can still remember probably five years ago uh, in, in a, a tournament in Atlanta, Lifetime Fitness, Kyle Yates going on an epic rant about the Tyson serve. So th- th- this has been around for a long time. Uh, and you're exactly right. If it's subjective, people are going to push. People are yeah. going to push. So uh, to I believe to, to PPA's credit, after the tournament, they have changed the rule. Yeah. So they, they instantly changed the rule. I believe that's what I read. Uh, and 
yeah, that's that's good for them to to make that that switch right away as it was it was obviously a, a weird situation. I remember Tyson just kind of walking around like saying, <laughs> "This is where, ridiculous. Where are we? <laughs> what are we doing? Where am I right now?" Yeah. Yeah, so, so it was pretty funny. Uh, yeah. uh, Tyson, uh, shout out to Tyson who I, I was doing my uh, checking social social media this morning and I just saw a picture of him in jeans shirtless with his mullet flowing. <laughs> just, li- you know, just living. This man's got some new ink. He's, he's yeah. shirtless. He's, he's doing his thing. The mullet is impeccable, man. He's uh he, he's a special one. TM. Yeah. TM bro. Just, you TM, know, bro. TM, hey, bro. Let, let's be honest though. He's, he's probably done a better job than anybody in the sport in terms of like creating that persona and, and, and having a look that's like identifiable to anybody outside of pickleball and you're like, Oh, that's Tyson, you know, like yeah, that's, right. that's a big deal in terms of like, you know, building a presence and, and starting to be recognized and stuff like that. Like in building a, building a personal brand as we, even before he's got the mullet and the, and the crazy stash and all this, um, <laughs> he's, he's done a really good job building his brand, even, you know, go, looking back four or five years. So, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So big props to him. I mean, that's, he's, he's a champion in that regard. Uh, and, and I think it is very important. He's starting to get some, you know, he loves old wrestler, loves MMA, he's starting to get some, you know, some back and forth between uh, uh, some, you know, people outside of the pickleball world that like to play pickleball. And he's, he's chatting with them and doing yeah. some different things, kind of bridging the gap with, with some different sports. So uh, yeah, TM, uh, hate him, love him, whatever. He's doing his thing and uh, he's, he's not holding back at all. So Nope. And he's, and he's helping grow the sport, honestly. Like, like talking about bring like, you know, connecting with different people. Um, yeah. That's just getting more eyeballs in the sport. So hell yeah. Hell yeah. TM bro. Uh, hey, we so got, we got, we got, we got Leia in the wings here. We got a guest Ooh. to on Ooh. the episode today. And, Come um, on. I asked her if there's anything we should avoid talking about. And she said, Nope, I'm an open book. So <laughs> bless her heart. Bless your heart. Leia Jansen. What's up guys. <laughs> How's it going? Hey, Leia. I'm actually out at your guys' old stomping grounds in Dreamland. Oh, Ooh. a little practice sesh or what's what you doing? Yeah, it rained. So me, Vivian, David, Lena, and Lauren Stratman, and I think she's bringing along Julian, are just going to, you know, do some good old rec games. Hey, that's a that's a great foursome. I'm not sure about Julian getting thrown in the mix, but uh, yeah. that's, that's four <laughs> solid ladies there, Leia. <laughs> It's nice to have like some women's so Lauren's uh, starting to spend a bit more time here now. So it's nice to have some women's practice in Austin. As you guys know, it's a lot of mixed practice, which isn't my forte. Yeah. There's <laughs> a lot of mix for sure. Yeah. So four solid women on the court doesn't beat that. You can't beat that. Is it cold? No. Or it looks chilly. Yeah. It's pretty cold. It's about 40 to 45 degrees right now. So kind of reminds gotcha. me of MLP. Yeah. 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 So we were just talking about um, some of the, some of the controversy stuff over the weekend with, with, you know, Jay cracking a couple shoulder high serves at Tyson and pushing the line. I was courtside for that. Yeah. And Tyson was just like looking at the sky, like, how is this, how is this really a rule where he could just reserve until he makes one? Okay. But honestly, uh, for me and Tyson, I think it's a great rule because we naturally serve a little bit high and it's so subjective. You get yeah. called for a reserve and actually NML stated that they made this rule for me but as usual they don't have facts and um, I actually just kind of took advantage of this rule back yeah. when my serve controversy happened um, and I tried to do the deco bar serve but I can't do that now <laughs> just grow grow about six yeah. inches you'll be fine yeah yeah Deckel can I can't though yeah <laughs> <laughs> love it uh, so talk to us a little bit about there's a little bit a little bit of controversy in your match with Salome um, and I think it was pretty late. I don't remember what game it was. Game one, game two. It was late in game two. Late in game two. And walk us through what happened. Okay. So we are, I, I just lost the game point and missed the serve as well. So, you, and I'm down a game. Um, I, I missed an easy volley at 10, nine, and then she hit a pretty big serve and I missed it. So we're at 10, 10. I come in, she lobs me as I'm mid flight about to hit the ball, somebody yells, it's going out, it's going out, to the point where I almost pull away, but then I decide I have to hit it, and I miss it. And so right then, I just am like, don't 
don't talk during the point because Sam Query actually said like, oh, I should just be happy there's fans there. But Sam Query, there were five people there the <laughs> whole time. Yeah. And everyone was quiet the whole time. So at 10, 10, that's when you decide to shout out. So I just go to the ref, like, is that a hindrance? And she yeah. actually agrees with me and says like, yes, you can call a hindrance. And I'm like, okay, let's call a hindrance then. Oh. Um, like, so pretty much that was it. And then Solomon didn't agree. So she called the head ref, Don Stanley. When Don came on the court again, and I'm on their, on factual reporting said that like he talked her out of it, but actually Don Stanley gave his spiel of if he's called to the court and whoever challenged it is wrong, you get a technical warning, which is basically a loss of timeout. Both of us at 10, 10 had no timeouts. So she would have suffered a loss of point. And so she's like kind of in a pickle, doesn't really know what to do. She's like, well, I mean, she just kind of takes her chances right there. And we replay the point. Then I think Don released a statement saying, like, had he been asked, he would have sided with her um, as well. So from my perspective, I just was in the moment being like, are, are you kidding me? It wasn't like there was crowd noise the whole time. You know, like a lot of times yeah. there's a lot of crowd noise during double stays and you're like used to it. I mean, this is 6 p.m. on a Thursday singles day. As you guys know, there's just not a big crowd. And for one person to shout out, like one of the five people there, literally, to shout out at 10-10 overhead, it's going out, it's going out. You know, I just kind of like in the moment was like, I mean, how is that not a hindrance? And if you're going to side with me, well, okay. But had they not yeah. sided with me, I mean, I, like I would have taken it. I've had the refs overrule me. I've had the refs like yeah. not overrule a person. You just kind of move on to the next point. So that was my yeah. perspective. I was surprised. It gained the traction it did, but I should know in pickleball, they're always looking for something. Doesn't take much. Doesn't take yeah. much. <laughs> no, that's good perspective. Yeah. Um, I didn't really, I didn't have the context of that it was, yeah, that it was that empty and that quiet. And, and it was, yeah, I mean, I think that's the biggest issue. Like I'm, I'm an advocate of like, if we're going to get, if we're going to like have pickleball be a free for all, let's just let noise the whole time. Like, exactly. Like, don't hold back. If that's, if that's the standard, that's the standard. Let's play with it. It's all good. But that, that is the biggest concern is if it's just quiet the whole time and, you know, whether it's an overhead or whether it's a, a deep, and it was, you know. It wasn't really saying like, you know, someone screaming, like, come on. It was like someone trying to give me advice on a ball I'm hitting. I'm like, <laughs> shut up. Yeah. What are you doing? Like, you know, and at that stage at a 10-10, I lost a close first game that went back and forth. I just lost the game point kind of like to get into championship Sunday. I was just like. You know, I just kind of acted on, on reaction. Have they shut me down? Great. Okay. Move it on. Yeah. You got to ask though. I would have asked. You have to. Of course. Who wouldn't ask in that? Like yeah. in that it's basically like asking for an overrule of that, at that yeah. stage. So yeah, that, that's my perspective. I feel like, uh, this won't be my first nor last singles controversy though, because, uh, I am a person who plays with a lot of emotion. So it just, it's just going to come out sometimes. Yeah, and I hope it does. <laughs> but I've had, I've had some people tell me, like, send me a message and be like, that was like Lobgate. How are you going to? I'm like, this in no way was me complaining about sun. This was like me complaining about someone giving me advice on a big ball. Yeah. That I, like, you know, on a big match. It's what a weird. Yeah, Go super ahead. weird that it wasn't like just a yell. It was literally like your partner <laughs> calling you off of a ball. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm like, who yeah. are you? I don't know who you are. Why are you like talking during this? I mean, and you can hear during the match, there's like no claps going on, nothing going on. It's dead as can be on a Thursday night. I mean, I think I was the last of my final on that night. There was nobody but Mary Brasha's uh friends and family and during my bronze match like not even the pta <laughs> workers were there anymore i think this person just really wanted you to win and they just couldn't hold it in <laughs> i mean i'm really happy that, for that but it did not unfortunately help me win <laughs> so, and then that's you know that that's also was in the back of my head once the point was replayed like after that i'm like uh, i mean like now i'm feeling like weird i don't know which way this is going it kind of takes yeah. away your like competitiveness of it almost no for sure it's tough to jump out of that and, and yeah. i see that 
uh, it, it makes sense now that you get neither one, neither player had a timeout. So it would have been a point penalty if, is, is that, is that the issue? Yeah. So it would have been a point. Yeah. Penalty otherwise she would, otherwise she would have challenged. That makes sense. Okay. That makes a lot of sense actually. So, um, yeah, that's an interesting situation. I think there was one in, in tennis as well. Taylor Fritz against, uh, Djokovic, the exact same thing happened. He was about to hit a, hit a backhand uh, up the line winner and someone yelled out from the crowd. And it, especially when it's quiet, if, if there's tons, you guys talked about it, if there's tons yeah. going on, you don't notice it, but when it's completely quiet forever and then someone uh, yells out, it, it's almost impossible to block that out. Yeah. Yeah. And people, I, I got another message being like, you, you couldn't play basketball. I'm like, I did play basketball and we practiced <laughs> with, loud noises all the time because we were always playing with loud noises. So yeah. when I like when I was playing volleyball, I was always accustomed to going up in my swing and someone shouting something, but you went not at this point. So it was it was a weird thing that happened and I don't know if it will happen again, but it would be interesting if it does happen again because like you know, what if a player is just really hated and at a big point, a fan knows this and just wants to yell something in the rap swing. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And I think even, I don't know if it was Query that mentioned it, but it was like, Oh, I'll just bring a drunk buddy and have him yeah. yell. Yeah. Every time, every time I need to win a point. Sam Query gave more than his two cents on that situation. Yeah. <laughs> like, I've never like I, as someone who played on the tour, this is the worst call you've ever seen. I think he said, yeah. like, if I were Salome, I would have packed it up. I'm like, well, if she was confident enough in this call and knew the rule, she she could have challenged. Yeah. Well, no, that's that's great perspective, and uh, we appreciate that, Leia. But here here is a more important question for you. How, how are your dogs doing? My dogs? My dogs are yeah. actually with my ex-boyfriend. So. Oh. Unfortunately, I think they're doing oh, great. No. I hope they're doing great. Uh, but I actually gave them up to come to Austin. Oh wow! I didn't realize that. Sorry to bring. I know I'm kind of like I'm kind of like you, Adam. Like uh -huh. we had to give the dog up to move. I uh, well, I can so, relate to that too. Oh wow! All three of us can relate to. I mean, that, <laughs> that's painful it's stuff. So, we need we need to get together and have a pity party for each other. Uh, because, I know, right? Man, it's too bad. Uh, I actually but, haven't seen you in a long time. So congratulations on the marriage and the baby. That's awesome. Well, yes. Thank you. And really it is crazy. I haven't seen a lot of the, you know, the, the PPA players or, or the players playing more PPAs for almost two years. It's, it's completely wild. And that's a yeah. perfect, it's a perfect little segue because Rob and myself have been, have been doing the, well, a lot of non-playing with injuries, <laughs> but, but some APP stuff as well. So we wanted to get a, a, a player perspective on, on just, you know, maybe some of the tour war stuff and some of this uh, MLP vibe merger. Uh, you got anything good for us from, from your perspective, Leia? So from my perspective, like from the female's perspective, I would say like, you know, at the beginning of this year and like why I signed with the PPA last year was like, I, you know, I wanted to go play with the top players. I, it was kind mm -hmm. of more like a pride thing to me. And the APP tour has really developed and grown quite a, quite leaps and bounds. So it's very unfortunate for me when you're looking at like a partner perspective of like, gosh, it would be awesome to go play with a Vivian David and an Andrea Coop and a Jackie Kawamoto and a Lauren Stratman and a Georgia Johnson and Anna Bright. And like, you know, it's gotten deep now. And I'm yeah. sure, you know, Lucy, Callie and all that, a lot of us, Jesse, feel the same way. So to me, like uh, the women are so split that it's very unfortunate for the sport. It's very unfortunate for like partnerships. I thought nationals was a lot more fun because we saw a lot of it. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, so to me, it's like, it's a bummer for the growth, uh, for the growth um, and yeah. just putting the best product out there because, you know, I can say at the beginning of the year, I really thought like, oh, there's no doubt who's stronger now I look at it and you know I look at a lot of women's doubles and it's amazing how much better people have gotten and like I'll never forget when me and Catherine played Anna Bright and Georgia Johnson and I hadn't played Georgia Johnson in a long time and we were match points down against them and Georgia was like I couldn't speed up on her she wasn't missing balls in transition I'm like what where like I haven't seen this in forever so <laughs> yeah. a lot of us 
PPAers are like at a disadvantage too, because we're not playing a lot. I got so much better last year because I was just playing all the time. I got a lot of confidence yeah. uh, this year. I think, you know, lots of confidence is for other reasons, but I kind of felt like I plateaued in my devil's game just strictly because of, you know, not being able to switch up partners and playing with a lot of partners. And also yeah. like I wasn't playing as much against as many people. Yeah. You're seeing the same, you're seeing the same matchups over and over and over um, and over yeah. again. Like I, I, I told someone a few weeks ago, if me and Catherine have to play Lucy and Callie one more time, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to lose it. I'm going to lose it. Like it gets, it's boring for me as well. Yeah. So it's unfortunate for the product, but that's why I do like the MLP and vibe merger. You know, it is great. It's not, I, I do think we need a union from the player's perspective because we've yeah. lost a lot of our power in it. But for the product perspective, I am really happy because I, I mean, it, it was a big issue for me um, as Tyson has spoken out. I didn't speak out publicly, but a lot of people who talked to me knew it was a very big deal for me. Uh, not being yeah. able to play in MLP. Yeah, especially uh, having a really nice run and playing with quality partners with the Discovery Warriors, that, that first MLP. Yeah. To, to, to it have was that so much and then, fun. And then have it taken away from you. That's that's a pretty sad story for sure. Yeah. yeah, and then like I would watch it too. And you just, you like in Columbus, you felt the energy. People are just losing their minds. And you're just like, yeah, I mean, it's really hard to watch that. Even in the first one, it was just... Like I was always on the edge of my seat and now the stakes are getting higher and everything. And it, it was just, it's kind of a bummer. So I'm glad something has happened. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm still super curious on, we haven't heard much since the merger about what the format's going to be, how it's all going to shake out, what style draft it's going to be. Are there going to be two divisions with 12 teams each? Is one going to be a top division? One going to be a bottom division? Um, all of that stuff. So super curious to see. Um, I, I care less about who the next round of team owners are. I'm care more about like what the format's going to be, what it's going to look like. Cause I think that's what everybody really wants to know. I mean, yeah. you can, you can keep announcing, you know, a list celebrity owners, but you know, it's good for a day, but it, now it's kind of like Adam talked about in the prior episodes, just like the diminishing returns of like, we're not surprised anymore. Right. We're now we're expecting a LeBron level right. of celebrity. I even forgot about LeBron. That was, I mean, it's, it's huge. I think this is going to be huge. And, uh, I like me, my, for me, this was like a huge thing for me to happen. Um, uh, because, uh, yeah, I was definitely very unhappy with not being able to play it. And I was very yeah. unhappy that I was one of the few players who did not commit to buy because I was like, I, I don't want to go play against everybody who I've been playing against. I want to go yeah. play MLP. So I was very happy that something happened. What was uh what was the general consensus of of the PPA players around like before the Vibe MLP merger happened and before even the Vibe even the Vibe league was announced? Um, obviously, Tyson said what you know he wanted to say. He's not happy with it, and the biggest prize purse in pickleball, he's not eligible for. What was the general consensus amongst other PPA players? Was it the same as Tyson? They just didn't speak out on it. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, to be honest, uh, I would say the PPA has become very businesslike nowadays. So people kind of keep their cards pretty close to their chest. Yeah. And this was kind of, uh, you know, like a taboo topic. So if when Tyson spoke out about it, it was like, whoa. It, su it surprised so, me, yeah. Yeah, it, it was kind of like, uh, you know, like you, you talking back to your parents almost. That's kind of how it's <laughs> yeah. <going to> play. <laughs> so, or like going against your boss. So, um, I, I think the consensus of those who are team players really had a good experience in playing it. Um, I know there's a few who didn't because they felt like, oh, they were drafted too high and the person they played with wasn't good enough. But, you know, like I would say most people, like they really missed it. And this is why we complained and they came up with this vibe league supposedly you know like this was to make us happy yeah do you think vibe was ever going to really happen or was the intention never to make it happen i i it's hard for me to believe but you know <laughs> hey they but, made, they made sweatshirts they made sweatshirts come on hoodies let's go i, know. <laughs> I never got a sweatshirt you know so I, but yeah you can it, go on it, an ebay yeah i mean they just seem like uh, you know, uh, I'm, there's just a lot of moving parts and, you know, a lot of powerful people in this. So there's going to be a lot of chess moves to kind of get what they want. So, yeah. but the thing is we get to play MLP and I am beyond excited about it. 
Yeah, it's going to be so fun. I, yeah, I'm just pumped for more details so we understand kind of the format and how it's going to how it's going to be laid out. Yeah, I, so I heard it's twelve and twelve, like twelve teams and twelve teams, one major league, one minor league, which um, you know I think is cool. So, it, it, and for and like uh, I remember last year, what I just think is really cool is like uh, after MLP girls were like, you know, there's no way we're going to do it because there's no way there's 24 girls. Now I, yeah. I like with the, with the merger, like there, there is like, there's 24 girls. This is going to be awesome. Like Anna Lee yeah. is not going to have to go play with my grandma. She can go play yeah. with a good girl who I'm sure Anna Lee's team will be very tough. hundred percent. I agree. I think, I think the, and it's only like, I think we're about to see a lot more tennis players come in too, but I think, yeah, you're right. There's the depth on the women's side has really, really grown and become substantial. And, um, it's coming yeah, in I, singles, women's singles yeah. this next year will become what men's singles was this year. I, I just played totally a girl, Catherine. I just played a girl after I lost to Solomon. Um, you know, she was pretty hot and cold, but I think she took Catherine to three and maybe had a match point. Um, Dominique Schaefer, she's becoming very good. We have Salome, yep. she's becoming very good. All these tennis players are going to be coming in and flooding the women's singles. Yep. I think it's going to be a lot like the Federicos, the James Ignatowicz is coming in. Uh, you know, just at Newport, there was like a 25K UTR event going on. If more people were watching pickleball. Like if I'm one of yep. those players, I'm going to go look at pickleball. No, totally. Why, like, why would you not? It's, it's lower hanging fruit than than trying to grind 25k UTR tennis tournaments. Yes, exactly. And way, and way more fun. <laughs> I agree. I agree. What else you got, Adam? I know we had some uh, other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I had a couple things listed down here and you can, you know, you can not answer if you would like to not answer. She says she's an opinion. open book. Yeah. Open book is an open okay. book. So I'm, I'm going to try to take advantage right, of that. So just, just wondering what your uh, kind of status is with the PPA moving forward and possibly some uh, uh, possible partnerships for 2023, if you can share any of that information. So, yeah, I'm actually just kind of solidified with Connor Pardo that I'm going to stay with the PPA this next season. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually going to be playing with Tyson McGuffin. So... Bands getting back together again. <laughs> uh, but I'm excited for it. I mean, me and Tyson have a very long history. Um, obviously, we didn't get going last year just because I think, you know, I, I, I can speak on my part. I didn't handle the situation great. But also at the beginning of the year last year, my health was in terrible, terrible form. And um, the expectation of playing with Tyson was very daunting to me. Mm. Um did I handle it right? No. And then, you know, we were very close as well. So I think he's on record as saying I stabbed him in the heart. And I truly, I, I've, I've eaten crow quite a bit this year, let's just say. Um, <laughs> the heart's better than the back. <laughs> there you go. There's nothing behind his back, let me tell you. And so, um, but I'm excited for it. I think we'll be a good team. And then my women's doubles partner is actually Elise Jones. Um, nice. which I, all ice, I think as tropical kind of explain a lot of my outspoken support of her. Um, you know, I think a lot of people had dealt with the two culprits in that situation and just kind of always felt disrespected. And, um, I just think Elise is a person who works too hard and I have too much respect for, yeah. um, to kind of like, you know, not say anything. Yeah. I like not, yeah. I like Go that ahead. too. And I, I, I think that you're, in terms of court coverage from the left, I think you're you're one of the better better ladies out there. And obviously, the biggest issue for Elise, or one of the biggest issues, is that wingspan. So to have her on the right and you on the left, I think that that could be a really solid team with her consistency and your firepower. So I, I like it. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I I've spent a lot of this year kind of playing in the box on the right. Which I mean, I, I, Adam, you're a pickleball analyst. I think everyone knows the game plan against me, and then that's to keep me in the box. So. Just starting in the box all the time. But I'm, I'm right. thankful for it because it made me a lot more consistent player. Like, never used to be able to dig from the transition zone. Now I actually think I'm pretty good from there. Um, and it's taught me how to really set up points. But I do miss just going crazy and short points and just having, you know, a free-for-all out there. That's kind of where I feel like I'm at my best. And I feel like that's where women's doubles should be played. So I, um, I think Elise is very underrated. You know, she's been playing... 
not so long, has a, a racket, doesn't really have a huge racket sports background. She'll set you up. She's got a great forehand dink. Her hands aren't heavy, but they are fast. Um, and she 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 doesn't miss a drop. She doesn't miss a transition ball. And um, I just want someone out there who believes in me and will die on the court. At least will not only fall. She will die on that yeah. court with you. <laughs> well, you got you got that from her for sure. Like that's yeah. And I think that's kind of like why everybody was so outspoken, especially on the pro side in terms of everything that happened um with with that breakup in terms of or the the partnership thing adam i'm sorry i had to say it i know i know but um yeah you have pros come to her defense because she is such a fighter everybody knows how hard she works and she's such a she's such a sweet person that um i think yeah it's 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 a great fit for you i think you guys that'll be fun to watch and i think you guys will be fan favorites for sure yeah and you know like as we saw this year like uh you going after names to me i'm like completely done with like you people build so much throughout the year and you just have to have to yeah. trust a lot on chemistry who brings the best out of, like i remember me no one would have picked me and vivian david to be a good team last year but we both respected each other's games we trusted each other's games and we had good energy on the court and that makes a good team it's not always the best names right and i, I think that's super important too talking about how, how tight everyone's getting and the depth getting better. If, if you don't have good vibe, if, if there's a little something going on, that's a huge deal. Maybe a, two years ago, you could have just overcome mm-hmm. it with talent, but now it's more of an issue. So if your rapport with your partner isn't where it needs to be, you're, you're going to be in trouble. Yeah. If you, and you're, if you're just feeling on pins and needles as well, you're, you're going to lose 11, nine, you're going to lose 12, 10, you're going to lose that third game. So you got to have yeah. some, Somebody who's out there just being like, yeah, go swing. Like, this is awesome. And, uh, yeah, so I feel like it will be fun, win, lose, or draw. That that matters a lot, actually. Fun. Yeah. If it's not fun, nobody – like, it's it, it doesn't matter how much money is involved, right? It's like it's it's not fun being on a court when, when you're not in a good mood and you're not happy and you're not feeling like your partner has your back. Spirit yeah, breaking exactly. is what it is. It's it's just it, it, it maybe maybe you can handle it for a couple tournaments, but after a couple, it really starts to just crush your spirit. So uh, they, they, Adam, they, you would know. I I always said Adam was my dream mix partner because it always looked like he was having so much fun with his partners. And I saw yeah. him play um, a tournament with someone who Adam did not look like he was having very much fun with, and uh, he definitely just kind of went into his turtle shell, like a lot of us can. So, <laughs> and that's rare for Adam because Adam's usually smiling on court or at least like, you exactly. know, motivating and like very upbeat and positive. Like I would, I would call Adam probably one of the best pickleball partners that you could have. Well, it's, yeah, uh, I've always thought so too. And it's been, well, and that's kind of been one of my, like, I, I think a lot of people can say, uh, I'm hard on myself, but I'm never really hard on my partner. So I'm just, yeah, I got to look for somebody like that and somebody who doesn't have like eagle eyes also behind me. Right. And, and Hey, when you, when you lack, when you lack talent, you better, come <laughs> through, you better come through in other ways and be, being a good partner and, you know, getting, getting the big man deckle bar fired up and playing well is just as important as me playing well. So uh, it's, it's a real thing. People might not understand uh, just jumping on court with somebody. You, you got to have that vibe. It makes a big difference, especially with how talented everyone is these days. Oh yeah, Absolutely. level is getting You're an elite crazy professional high. athlete. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. Leia, tell Adam he's an elite professional athlete because he really like watch it. Watch his face when you say it too. You are an elite professional athlete if you were to ever <laughs> do any kind of elite professional athlete stuff. Adam is amazingly <laughs> talented for his regimen and his practice regimen and his for his regimen. <laughs> Like it's, it's impressive. If I would have done that, zero wins. I am yeah. so regimented and like work really hard. And then there's Adam. Yeah. Just like, yeah, let's do it. I, I I enjoy I enjoy a nice large pizza and several IPAs sometimes. So, you know, yeah. it, it's gotten me through a couple different times. So I, I I'm I'm not upset at all about it. <laughs> and Leah, just in terms of like the pro landscape and what we're gonna like. Like what you just mentioned is, you know, the, the talent gap's much smaller, right? From, from top to bottom. Uh, like, it, it's going to be like these little, it's going to be these little difference makers, like who your partner is, how you vibe with them. Um, I think we're going to continue to see that trend 
And to the point almost where, like we talked about this uh, with, with beach volleyball, is you're eventually going to have a partner that's set throughout the year and you're going to have no choice but to train with them throughout the year. Because that little, those, you know, having the court time with that person, having, you know, the chemistry is going to matter a lot more as these margins get smaller and smaller. Do you see that? Do you see that happening moving forward? Am I frozen? Oh, we lost her. Uh, yeah, we can't hear you. AirPods die, maybe? <laughs> it's possible. Yeah, no, we, we still... Uh, oh, actually, let me see. You're listening on mute for... Let me see. Let me see. Oh, it says your mic isn't connected. Uh-oh. What are your thoughts on that, Adam, though? So we'll wait for Leia to come back. Leia, just... Maybe... Yes, no. Yeah, I, go ahead. I, I think it... I mean, I just can't describe to you how frequently you know, people just show up and, and, you know, maybe play two or three or four rec games the day before a competition and then just jump out there and play, uh, live, live in different parts of the country. So I, I think consistent practice with your partner. Uh, and I think it's going to happen in these team events as they get bigger and bigger as well. There's going to be maybe a, a central location and there's going to be practice leading up to the event event or, or maybe yeah. you, come, you come for a weekend uh, because you, I said it when I was talking to Leia, you, talent is great and it's very, very important, but these, these edges are razor thin and they're only going to get thinner and thinner as more and more people come in. So you better, I, I, I honestly think that there's going to be more set plays, more two and three shot combinations and, and situations uh, like this, where it's not just, reacting to what's happened it's having a game plan it's almost like basketball where you're going to run play one two three four or five yeah. and that's and that can really really help you get over the hump and i think it's just going to keep growing and growing in that regard yep leo you back with us i am sorry no you're all good okay cool um, yeah. did you get the last question though just talking about um no. how players are eventually going to be kind of training together more living kind of in the same place thoughts on that Oh, for sure. I mean, it, it, it's becoming a thing now where like that extra two to five percent is it's really, really, you know, really important. And, and unless you have two, uh, like look at Deckel and JW in their first tournament together, two elite talents. They're not used to playing with each other. They're not used to their roles and they don't have a good tournament together. And then look at them xyz tournaments later and they're beating yeah. matt and riley two and three in like five minutes so i think you, having someone that you're used to having those rules set having like adam said like set up plays like it in times of being we're gonna go here i mean something i talk to my partners a lot about is partner combos so if i speed up here you have to be here so we can clean it up um, I think we're going to see, start seeing a lot more of like, okay, when we're in the, when we're down and we need an attack, I want you to speed up to their back end. I'll close middle on the forehand. We should get what we're looking for there. hundred percent. I know. I agree. And uh, yeah, I think it's been like Adam said, just kind of show up day before a tournament, get some rec in, um, just go out and, Oftentimes, I even talk to your partner about a strategy, which is, I mean, that's just, there's <laughs> exactly. going to be like, there's a point in the very near future where that's, that's going to be laughed at. It's going to be like, what? You should just go out and like get on court and just play the people in front of you without like really thinking about what you're doing <laughs> and talking together. What? Yeah, it, it, it could be something. I mean, I, I've, I've showed up to play with someone before and it could, like the only strategy we talk is, oh, we'll return to him and we'll dink to him. You know, I mean, yeah. it's just yeah. like super, super bare yeah. bones. Uh, a strategy with no no real nothing in depth whatsoever and and you're just not going to be able to get away with that moving forward and uh it, it's there, there's just no way not if we're talking like a 50 50 matchup right like where it, it's a coin flip the team that actually I mean, has a well thought out strategy will be the team that wins that are you saying that yeah i mean there's a reason why i i I said, there's a reason why in singles, I'm one of the most consistent singles players and I'm not really too shocked when I play someone the first time. I, I, I think you guys know I'm a, like, I, I do my homework quite a bit. And if you can find somebody who also is willing to listen, like do that homework with you, 
I mean, look at the Johns. They win by margins because they know a lot about the players. So yeah. when I go into singles matches and what when I have a partner who's on the same page going into a doubles match next year, we're going to know what percentage of drops you're going to hit people to. You're, gonna, you're not going to be shocked by them um, because – like a lot of people are going to start doing a lot. Yeah, definitely. I, I've had some really good conversations uh, before with you and Kyle McKenzie as well. You know, just some, you know, general uh, kind of strategy type stuff. And and like you said, to, to have a little partner in crime and bounce ideas off someone and, and talk about those things, it can really it, it, I think moving forward, it's going to be not as important, but pretty close to as important as, as putting in practice and court time uh, before before these these matchups, because things happen quick out there. And, and if you don't have if you just have a default strategy or, or a, a situation that you can fall back on when times get tough in, in these matchups, it's just going to be huge as opposed to just kind of figuring it out in the moment, which is just very difficult to do in these spots. Yeah, I, I, I really agree. And so many good players are getting good. And a lot of players have so many different shots. I mean, the reason why I moved to Austin was after my sickness coming back, I was like, what happened to everyone? The level just got so high so mm-hmm. quickly. And it's just going to keep and keep and keep improving. Yeah, so I uh, – how about this? So I, I have not had a lot of exposure – because uh, she's so new. What what are your thoughts on Edda Wright's game? Uh, she has really come on uh, this last year, uh, or she's only been playing for a year and really come on these last months or two. And she seems to have the physical tools and kind of the demeanor to be a really solid player. What do you think about her game? So I was a big fan of Edda when I, I, I watched her at MLP. Um, and she is, and uh, me and Catherine faced her in Vegas. And right when you step on the court, you're like, this girl's a stud. Mm-hmm. No joke of an athlete, like might be the best athlete on tour. She's very quick. She's got quick and heavy hands and her demeanor. Like you said out there, she's just very mentally tough. Nothing yes. looks to rattle her. Nothing really. And it, it doesn't seem fake. Like it's almost like Ben, where you're just like, do you show emotion? Like mm-hmm. even when she plays a great point, she's not going to give you a come on. So she d- doesn't really give you anything. And, she, I, like, I thought she played great all weekend when I saw her, my first round matchup. I knew that was going to be a really tough one, especially if Irina is playing very well. Um, and she's one of the few true left side girls I can see kind of coming into this game where she's got attacks on both sides and she's still so bra. It's kind of right. like the scary thing, you know? Um, so I, I don't like, I think she's like a one in every year kind of prospect, really. Right. No, that's a good breakdown. And I, I, you, you've said this a couple of times and we talk about this as well. There's a difference between fast hands and heavy hands. And man, if you have both watch the hell out where you're, you're quick, you can get to spots you need to get to. And that ball flies off your paddle with a, with a lot of thud. So to have that combination of fast hands and heavy hands, Ooh, baby, that's, that's, that's pretty sexy. Yeah, she and she doesn't really have a like she kind of reminds me of like when I first started playing the left, she doesn't have a lot of speed ups besides anything out of the air, and you kind of have to give it to her out of the air. So that's right. scary, right. scary to me. Once that girl starts speeding up off the bounce, when she starts mm-hmm. moving her feet and using her forehand, she, when she gets ahead, it's going to be hard to catch up. I think it's going to be a block mentality against her because she's going to want it. Yes, and I think this does happen a lot where someone has the raw skills, the defense, the the counterattack ability, but to get some tricks and some speed ups to kind of start the fire can really just elevate you to the next level. We've seen it with so many players I can think of recently, even Riley, you know, six months, nine months ago, he was he wasn't initiating as much as he is now. And now his ability to start the fire and then trust all the tools that he has afterwards has really t- uh, taken him to the next level. And someone like Etta, I think really falls into that category as well. Yeah. I mean, uh, right sided girls would be-, be very, very smart to pair up with her. And if I'm even somebody who's at the top right now, I is what I I'm calling Etta right. All right. Well, because that's a great, like 
just I, I it's really hard not to believe in her game and like for, she's still steady in the transition zone and everything as well and she yeah. comes from Utah so she, you know she's getting high level play all day every day mm-hmm. yep uh, Robert you we have any more questions for our our first guest on the it feels right podcast Leah Jansen what do you got wow <laughs> Is she our first guest? Yeah, like first she, player guest, I suppose. Well, we, we had Prof on, but that was just for like 10 or 15 minutes. And, oh, and we, we had, we had uh, yeah, we had Shieldsy. But this is, the, this is the first real deal guest, and we're, I'm liking what's happening so far. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a good perspective on, on Etta and totally agree with all of it. And I think what you're talking about being able to attack off the bounce is a big deal. And I think you're right with Riley specifically, you know, you talked about um, him versus Collins brother and, and Riley is just less attackable. And also Riley is like Riley's attacking off the bounce and disguising it really well. You don't really see that from Collins brother. No, the bounce I mean, Riley is so improved, you know, it, like playing him. And I remember at the beginning of the year, someone asked me, is Riley Ben? And I said, I, and I, me and Thomas Wilson, I just played against them both in Minnesota. And I was like, not even close. Like I just played against them both. Me and Thomas actually upset Catherine and Riley. And I was like, just, you know, court, like court awareness, knowing where the ball's going, ability to put pressure, like not even close. I just have played Riley in recent months. Wow. Like yeah. it, it's, it's a completely different person. He seems to have a trainer and put on weight, which is adding, a, he actually has power now. And you, as you can see, he can even initiate off his forehand and he's yep. just so fast that it doesn't matter where you counter. He's there you counter behind him. Yep. He's there counter five feet away from him. Doesn't matter. He'll like block Catherine. She, he's got that. Yeah. And I think the next person on my list that I want to see this from is JW Johnson. Mm-hmm. So J- I've been J- wanting J- to see it since last year, Adam. Yeah. Like I, yeah. I, I think he will when it's necessary. That's the conclusion I've come to. But he, the, the, I mean, I think just having the the rightly edge is a big deal, and I, I love the demeanor of J Dub. I think it gets him through some lulls that that everyone has in their game. But I just want to see him have that edge because his his hand speed is electric. And if he can just get a few initiations under his belt that he can go to, uh, I, I think that he could have a rise like we've really seen from Riley in the last, whatever, six or nine months or so. I agree. If uh, JW just really committed to, like, you know, working his feet and really initiating off of everything, it's hard to think about what would get past him as well. I mean, he's already, yeah. such, a, he's already such a great mix player because he's so elite out of the air and he's so steady everywhere else. Imagine if he just put a bunch of pressure on the girl. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, Robert, were, were we going to discuss uh, Franklin at all in this or are we not going to touch that? Not yet. <laughs> not going to touch that. Okay, not good. Yet. Good. Okay. Okay, excellent. No, that's completely fine. Uh, that's that's my list. Uh, I don't have any more questions. I think, uh, Leia, you've done a great job uh, giving, giving us that perspective uh, from not only a female, but from a PPA female. And like you said, it's been it's been a while since I've been in the mix uh, on the court or even, you know, talking to, to a lot of these players off the court. So it's been a great perspective and we appreciate it. Yeah, yeah thanks, I, Leia, I, for hopping on. I hope going forward, we can start to, you know, edge to this gap, you know, uh, for, for some of us, me, myself included, I, I found where the business advantage is uh, of being a PPA player. Um, but I hope it at, at some point, sometime soon, we're talking a merger between the PPA and the APP because I have massive respect for the APP. I think what they've done is really stepped up their game leaps and bounds and they're really developing the game. And it's awesome to see such good girls coming over. And uh, I hope we get to see something where I get to play against them more because it brings more disparity. And I, a lot of them are very legit as we just saw this weekend. Yeah, totally agree. And I think it's better for everybody, right? It's, it's like, you know, like you said, matchups get stale. If everybody was at the same tournament, and we just combine purses, right? Like it'd be so much better. All the best players are at every tournament. The purses just doubled because now they're, you know, combined. Like now we have, now we have a real thing. Like, well, you know, and think- also 
you know, partnerships are like relationships. And I wouldn't say the woman's to- or is too steady in our relationships. So be nice if like we had options. Otherwise, mm. you're just stuck. And you're like, yeah. well, my other option is I don't even know. So I guess we're just going to have to hate our lives for a few more months. And that's not yeah. how it should be. We should have a lot of options. And that's mainly why. Yeah, totally agree. All right. Well, great talking to you guys. I hope uh, to see you all soon. MLP. Sounds good. Thanks, Leia. Like, like, go, go light them up at Dreamland. That's right. All right, Adam. Anything else we need to cover? I don't think so. We're, we're creeping up on uh, an hour and a half, and I'm losing focus. And I think that... <laughs> I think that the, the recaps, the talking about those uh, small controversies and getting some great perspective from Leia, that's going to that's gonna take us to the finish line, buddy. I agree. And I think next week we'll, we'll talk about the upcoming tournaments. We got one. We got an APP. I think it's the final APP of the year at, uh, in, in Phoenix at Mesa. Uh-huh. Um, and then we also have a Hertz Orlando PPA, um, which I think, I think that field is – pretty stacked with a lot of the APP guys yes. purely, purely because it's an easy trip for a lot of those Florida folks like uh, Rhett Meyer and J-Dub and Tardio and all those guys, Stacks Rude. So we'll, we'll probably see quite a few uh, APP players at the PPA, which everybody always loves because we have really deep singles draws. We have these guys coming up. Don't call them singles players. They're not <laughs> singles players anymore. That's right. And uh, yeah, just so that'll be a fun one. We'll be, it'll be, I know um, the APP was struggling with the registrations a little bit, so we'll see if that's picked up at all. Um, but I'll be going to the, I'll be going to the Phoenix one. I think, will you be there as well, Adam commentating? I heard. I, I will not be. So I'm going to, okay. I'm going to Hawaii. I'm going to oh. Hawaii oh. to see, to see you. That's right. Oh Robert. yeah. So, uh, I, I uh, yeah, and, also, and, and I had a little, uh, I had someone ask a question in a chat and I think this is a pretty interesting topic that we can touch on next time is where Anna Lee Waters would rank in the men's singles and the men's doubles game. And so we mentioned with Leia, we haven't seen those PPA players for so long. A big part of my rankings is my personal experience playing yeah. these players. So uh, I kind of made a statement and then I heard from some very well-respected PPA players, kind of their thoughts on the subject. So I think that'll be a fun one to tackle uh, next time as well. Yeah, I think, yeah, some of those, you know, my take on some of that, like some of their thoughts were to me a little mind blowing, but Hey, like you said, very, (laughs) these guys have played them, played her a lot and I respect their opinion. So we'll give, we'll, we'll, we'll share it and I'll share my counter arguments to it. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Uh, All right. All right, buddy. Uh, Until next time, uh, do your thing. Do your thing. Because you know why? Why? Because it feels right. It feels right. Legendary. Legendary.